Marcus, the Get Published radio show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has all the answers because, well, he's already made all the mistakes himself. And here he is with today's co-host, Cheyenne. Don't forget to go to GetPublishedRadio.com. In today's special episode of Get Published, we'll take you on a field trip to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA. Hold on there, Gerald. Cheyenne, don't interrupt. It's a radio show and you're taking us to an art museum. Don't you see any sort of disconnect there? (laughs) Bear with me. I'll try. We're going behind the scenes at an after-hours closed session of the American Art Council. I'm giving a talk about the scandal behind Julia Stewart's painting, The Baptism, which is the basis of my sixth novel, Bonfire of the Vanderbilts. I gave the presentation standing in front of the painting. So it is all about you. Okay, why am I taking you here? There is a good reason. One of the mantras on Get Published Radio is that no one is stopping you. I don't have a degree in art history. I'm just an enthusiastic researcher. But if I'd waited for scholars in this field to bless my results, or for the mainstream publisher to vet the project, it might never have gotten done. But as it was, I self-published in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. I still don't understand how we're supposed to follow this if we can't actually see the painting. Well, there's this new thing called television. I'd rather see it. Okay. Well, there's an even newer thing called the World Wide Web. <laughs> Listeners can go to our site and click on the magic button to see the painting. And how are we supposed to find this magic button? It's on the landing page. It's labeled magic button. I guess we'll just have to see about that. As you listen, realize even now that the museum doesn't necessarily agree with all my findings. But they were impressed enough to invite me to speak behind closed doors to this influential group. Curiosity. I was standing in front of the painting. It was almost 20 years ago. And I was intrigued by what the museum card said. I mean, there's the emotional pull of the painting, which is, you know, mother, daughter, life, death. But the museum card said... This event, and it is an event painting, may be a branch of Vanderbilt's. Nobody knows for sure. The painting has an inscription on the back which the artist took pains to remove. And I thought, that's bizarre. So I dug into research sources. I quickly found out that there wasn't any image of this inscription in any of the research sources. I couldn't even find out what the inscription said. The reason is it's behind a thick canvas vapor barrier. All right, I really need to see this inscription. You know, it's not much more than a scribble, but there, there it is on the website along with the image of the painting. Don't tell me. That magic button isn't magic. It's a hyperlink. Whatever gets you there. <laughs> now, this is the infrared scan taken pre-1980 when Herschel and Adler had the inscription, had the painting, be right before they sold the painting to LACMA. And it says, Sunday, 11 a.m. And then there's a scratched out word that looks like, it starts with a V, it, it looks like it really could say Vanderbilt's. So this is probably the origin of the rumor, although the Stewart family did say in their oral history that they thought it was Vanderbilt's. There was some bickering among them, but no one, no one, no one in the family would talk about it. Then also, by digging through the National Archives microfilm, I was able to find uh, a page of his diary is here, and you can look at the bottom, and it it says Sunday in his hand. You can compare Sunday here to Sunday here. So the question is, why did he cross it out? What was he trying to hide if he was trying to hide? There's one thing about Stuart I think we need to kind of wrap our heads around. I know that you're familiar with this to some extent. It's significant that we've got John Singer Sargent on the opposite wall. You've got somebody from basically the same school of painters. Some American expatriates like Sargent, uh, Stuart was born in the United States but moved there when he was a young boy trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in the traditions of uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme. And one of the things about Jérôme and his Venetian style, which basically is masses of white instead of black, Jérôme felt that the painter must always paint exactly what he sees. It was not permitted, and he called it chic. Chic, if you were to make something up or paint something from memory. Sargent is famous for saying, you know, I can't paint a soul because I don't see it. 
He also was ridiculed by his colleagues. Uh, there was Don Van Dyke in his memoir mentions that Sargent needed a marble column for one of his paintings. He didn't have access to one, so he had a carpenter come in and build one in the studio. So his colleagues said, oh, John, you got, made a really nice picture of a wooden post painted white. <laughs> and that's, that's actually significant in terms of decoding the things that Stuart did, because what we have here is an event painting. There's a, there is a historical event behind this. But then there are also tweaks and creative frills and other things that he added. But remember, with Stuart's mindset, you didn't just make things up out of whole cloth. So it's not a photograph, but it does have a bit more evidentiary weight than it might if, if you were talking about a modern figurative realist who, you know, the only place it exists is inside the computer. One of Stewart's closest friends, drinking buddies, was the Rupert Murdoch of his day, uh, James Gordon Bennett Jr. He was uh, a rake, a womanizer, chauvinist pig, and Stuart was a bachelor, not quite as much misbehavior as Bennett, but Bennett, it was probably Bennett or Bennett, one, of, one of Bennett's reporters that visited Stuart in his studio in March of 1892 when this painting was being finished. And he wrote this very short description in the paper. Mr. Julius Stuart is at present engaged upon a large work, the subject of which is a fashionable christening in a private parlor. He might not possibly care to have the scheme made public, and it is sufficient to say that he has treated his subject in an original manner. Well, what's that about? He's also, Stuart also signed this, J.L. Stuart, Paris, 1892. Now, Stuart did not always attribute a location to his painting. So one might wonder if he had a scheme. Yes, he finished it in his studio in Paris. We've got documentary evidence that that's the case. But as, to, as far as when this event occurred and how long it took and what the, what the provenance was behind that or the, the process, the evolution, that's very much in doubt. So was he trying to throw us off the track? Interesting question. Okay, so for those who haven't seen the painting, and that includes me, uh, don't you think it's time to tell us what's in it? When we come back, right after this break. You tease. You know, Get Published is all about helping you. Yeah, I mean you get published. And these days, the way to go is self-publishing, where there are no agents or editors or big publishing houses telling you you can't or making you feel like you're not good enough. You know, going back in history, many famous authors were self-publishers. With his own printing press, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, long before he was a famous statesman. That's how we know Ben's sayings, such as, Fish and visitors smell in three days. Seriously, if you want to change your life or change the world or both, it's a great time to get in the game. Ebooks are particularly easy. With a click, you can reach a worldwide audience. Did you know that there are more people in China who read English than those of us who use the language in all the rest of the world? So if you've got a story to tell, write that memoir or that novel that's been percolating in your head. And if you're an established professional, or if you have a job you dislike or no job at all, give us that business or technical or even political book that establishes you as an expert who deserves serious attention. Yes, it's easy to get published, but understand you'll need help if you want professional results. Editors and copy editors help you clean up your prose, book designers make the product eye-catching, and publicists help you be heard above all that social media noise. We have those support resources on our website getpublishedradio.com. And there we've also got a request for services form where you can get personal attention for whatever might be keeping you from getting it done. That's why we say getpublishedradio.com is your doorway to unlimited self-expression. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. Use it or lose it. It's the Get Published Radio Show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has all the answers because, well, he's already made all the mistakes himself. And here he is with today's co-host, Cheyenne. Don't forget to go to GetPublishedRadio.com. You have to admit, that guy must have been up to something. I think you're right. If he really didn't want anyone to see it, he could have painted it out. And then only to scratch out part of it? Suspicious to say the least. So now what? I'm going to talk about the clues in the painting that suggest who these people actually were. And again, for us visual types, the painting is on the website. 
Just click the magic button. The first thing we can do is, and it's an obvious thing to do, is get into likenesses because there are some people in here whose likenesses are not disputed by anybody. Okay, so the people, it's indisputable. This is Stuart's sister, younger sister, Ellen. One of the reasons it's indisputable is three years after this, he painted a picture called Room with a View, which, is, which shows exactly this likeness, this tall strawberry blonde. She's sitting in a window, and she's sitting in this dress, the same pink peignoir, probably hung in the studio, can't paint anything he can't see, right? So, sis, put on the dress, sit down, I need a model. So let's be clear what we're looking at. You're talking about the reclining woman in the lower right of the painting, the sick mother. And you're saying the model for her was the painter's sister, Ellen? That's right. I'm, I'm sure she was his model in the studio. But the event that inspired it was a Vanderbilt family affair. I'll show why. And I think he deliberately didn't want this person to look anything like the real mother, Alice Vanderbilt. And I'll explain why about that, too. And then there are the men seated on the other side of her. One looks like her husband, the other could be like a grandfather. Yes, and especially for these characters, we have to emphasize the difference between the likenesses of the studio models and what the real people looked like. This guy here, by, by the droop of his mustache, by the cut of his hair, he is not Cornelius Vanderbilt. This is, and there are pictures of her husband, August Brolman, who was a Dutch import-exporter of a prosperous family. They had a summer home in Tunis, for example. So that's August, and this is very likely August's father, Wilfried, a very conservative, staunch Huguenot, the founder of the import-export business. And he also is in other Stuart paintings. You can see him in Five O'Clock Tea, same beard. And this fellow up top right, you probably all know, is Stuart himself. He's put himself in the painting. He did the same in Hunt Ball. He, in Hunt Ball, he did it to show that he was there, because again, these event paintings, they had a lot of celebrities in them. And th that's one of the engines of an event, event painting. Remember, you're here in the pre-silent movie era. This is hanging at a pu big international public ex exposition. This is the cable miniseries of its day. However, if we get into the details of the painting and we start pulling this apart with Vanderbilt family history, it starts getting really, really interesting. So it seems to me, if this painting is about a real event, it's a religious ceremony. The priest is dressed a certain way. The title tells us it's a baptism. So the way the people are dressed, how they're arranged, and the things that they're doing have to be important clues. Great minds think alike, shall you? And the first place that you can start is with church liturgy, okay, with costuming. Let's be forensic here. One of the first people to comment on the painting was Canon Fred Barbie here at the museum, the Episcopal official. He was fascinated with the painting and so fascinated he wrote an article on Anglican Digest. He, he pointed out some of the details that everybody missed. But one of them was, he said, yes, these are American Episcopal robes, not Anglican as you'd expect in Europe. But the other thing that's really interesting about this is this is a parish priest, it's not the bishop. In the Episcopal Church, especially at that time, you had to be baptized by the bishop of your diocese and it had to be the diocese of your home church. In the bishop's absence, the rector could do it. So I got in touch with a fellow, a, a brilliant scholar and a very active one, Wayne Kempton is the head of historical research for the Episcopal Diocese of New York. And Wayne found a couple of very interesting things for me. The first thing was, if, if we're talking about Vanderbilt's by a process of elimination, and I, it's kind of a long process, but this would be Newport, Rhode Island. This would be the breakers in Newport.